This is a talk called Sloth and Envy, and the sloth part is in part, it took me a very long time to put this talk together. Uh, the Envy part, you'll see what that's all about. Now, just to get started, we're at Pi at New York. It's Tuesday, November 5th, 2019. That adds some you know, posterity to these talks in case somebody wants to watch this you know, in five years when I'm long gone. Yeah, I'll give it four years. I'll give it four years. I'm James Powell. If you like this talk, you can follow me on Twitter. I don't use this code. Um, I give other similar talks. Honestly, when I tried to figure out what you should do if you like this talk, I couldn't come up with a slide. So that's a good, I hope that's a good, uh, I hope that's a good endorsement. Now, I want to start with a little thought experiment. Did you know that the software that you use and you rely upon every single day was written and designed by just some person? And did you know that the software that you use and rely upon every day has code that you could read and you could just fully understand. It's not that hard. It's not that difficult. In many cases, it's just a lot of code. It's time consuming. And did you know that the software that you use and may rely upon every single day probably was written in C or had some portion in C? And so if that was the case, the System 5 ABI would specify that there were three possibilities for the entry point for that. And when I say entry point, I mean the int main. And when I say three possibilities, I mean you can either have an int main with nothing in it, or you can have an int main with an int and a car star array, or you can have this with the last car star at the end. You might wonder what that is. And so if you look at the full signature, the full signature would say that that last argument is an MP. It's a pointer to your environment. And when you look at this, you might say, that's kind of interesting. I've never seen that signature before. And hold on a second. Isn't there a typo there? And actually, there's not. Because I pulled this from the docs. This is the actual docs for the System 5 ABI. And when I was looking at it, I was wondering, is that really a typo? I suspect it's just the System 5 ABI, ABI authors being apolitical. Uh, unfortunately, I don't expect anybody to get that joke. Really, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and so, let's take a look at some interesting things. When I talk about environment, what do I mean? Well, I mean the thing when you type env, a bunch of junk pops up on your screen. And you might have seen that before. You know, if you want to see what it really is, this is a little bit of a closer view from your POC file system. It's just a giant set of null terminated strings where each string has an equal sign somewhere in it. And the first part of the string is some key, and the other part of the string is some value. It's some key value store that each program has access to. And you might be familiar with at least one of these things in your env, your path. What is your path for? It identifies what happens when you type the name of a binary that gets run when you want to run something. And if you look at your path, it's just a colon separated set of directories, which gives rise to the very first question for this talk. What if you have a directory with a colon in its name that you want to add to your path? The answer is, there is no answer. You can't do that. Uh, now, you may be familiar with this path, because you might have at some point tried to figure out, where's my Python? Which Python am I using? My system Python? Am I using my Python my Conda env? Am I using my Python in my virtual env? And you would have typed which Python. And you might have even typed which which. Oh, no, not that one. Which user bin which. Oh, well, not that one. That's kind of pointless. And you would have figured out that you know, there's actually a program called which that goes through and tries to identify which tool you're using by searching through your path. And this is what that program looks like. This is which.c from a package called which. It was just written by some guy. And if you look through this, you can kind of tell that it's like a new package. Because look at all these pointless options that it has. Because you really need a lot of command line flags when you're trying to figure out which binary you're running out of your path. And if you look through this, you might see that it's actually quite straightforward. There's just a function called path search that just searches through your path by taking that environmental variable, splitting it on the equal sign, splitting the right-hand side of the equal sign in a colon, and searching for the thing that you wanted. Now, you might also be familiar with this because when you were working with your virtual environment or your condo environment, you had this source bin activate, and you might have looked at that source bin activate, and you would have seen that all it really does is set a bunch of environmental variables like path or Python path or old virtual Python home or some nonsense like that. And you might have seen recently on Twitter, there was a very nice blog post by a colleague of ours, Brett Cannon, about why you should always say python m pip install as opposed to just a pip install. And you might have wondered, can I do python m conda install? And the answer is, no, you can't do that. Uh, don't ask me why. Now, the reason that you might do the two of these is because when you think about it, the very first argument that you find in your, that you, that you put on the command line here is determined by your path. And so the python 3.8 that you run could be the Python 3.8 in your virtual env, in your conda env, at your system, and your path will determine which of the three that you run. If you type pip install, the pip that will you, you will be using to install a package might be the one in your virtual env, might be the one in your conda env, might be the one in your system, and it may not be clear which one it is. It may be the case that you have pip on one of your Python installs, 
which doesn't happen to be, yeah, somebody's side, so somebody's run into this, which doesn't happen to be the one that you, in, that you intended to install the package in. So you did a pip install, and then you launched your Python interpreter. They were actually in completely different paths, and so you pip installed something, you tried to import it, and you were very confused. And that's why they say always do Python 3.8-m pip install. I hope you didn't learn anything new. Now, if you look at this, this is about the signature for what you might see for, say, a main function that happens to have that third argument with the mp. Now, this is not altogether that interesting, and you might wonder, well, what do we do with this mp? Where does it come from? And so if we take this binary and we disassemble it, we know that any C program starts with a start symbol, and it runs a bunch of stuff. And one interesting thing is, this int main that you write, which could have three possible signatures, is not what actually runs when you launch your binary. What actually runs is a libc start main that then calls your main, which is why you have the ability to have three possible signatures, which may or may not throw away some arguments. Now, if we were curious about what that libc start main was and how we go from the process starting with the environmental variables to being able to use them, we might look into the source code for libc, which looks kind of like this. And you can see here's the entry point. This is the actual code that runs whenever a binary starts. If you're compiling it on Linux for x86 uh, using libc, and there's a bunch of comments about what all these assembly language instructions do, and then somewhere toward the end, you can see that it calls a main function. And the main function that it calls happens to be a main function that happens to be a main function in, or actually it happens to be a, an initializer that's also in libc, and there's a bunch of code here, and eventually it calls this libc start main that has all of these arguments that we saw in the last of the three possibilities. And if you scroll through this and look through this code, it's very ugly. Uh, it's got a lot of type def, it's got a lot of underscores in it, but eventually you'll see a line where somebody did something like this. They took the environment that was passed to your program and they assigned it to a variable called n, or called environ. And then, in your Python program, you are able to use it. If we look at this from the other end, you know in your Python program, you can say from OS, import environ, get env and put end. And if you look at the environ, it's just a dictionary with all the environmental variables. You can see this is a very clean environment, which is a lang and a term. And you have put env, so you can add in another environmental variable. And environmental variables are strings, so I can't say add one that's an integer. I have to turn it into a string like this. And if you look at that, you can see, oh, it's in my environment. Actually, no, it's not, because that doesn't work either. If you put something into your environment using put env, you can't get it back out using environ. You have to get it back out using get env. And so again, oh wait, that didn't work either. So you can see sometimes things don't quite work the way you want them to work. But if you dig a little bit deeper, you might figure out why that might be. And so if we look at the source code for your OS module, where you ultimately get your environ, your get env, and your put env, you might see that on startup, when this module is first imported, it does this create environ. And if you look at that create environ, you might see that all it is is a dictionary subclass that makes it so that when you assign to that dictionary, it calls put env under the covers. When you pull out of that dictionary, when you do a get item on that dictionary, it does get env under the covers. And if you dig a little bit deeper and you figure out where those get env and put env functions come from, you might see that there's a module, if you happen to be on Linux, called your POSIX module. And in your POSIX module, there's one step when that is initialized that creates an environment that takes that environ variable that we just saw that threaded through your program from the initial entry point to your libc start main and converts it to a Python dictionary. There's actually two Python dictionaries involved. There's one at the POSIX module level and one at the OS environ level. And if you look through this module, you might see a bunch of other things that you recognize, like a getenv call that just calls getenv. So you have a mirroring of what's happening in Python, what's happening in C. But as a consequence of you building these data structures in Python that mimic these data structures in C, you sometimes have discontinuities where if you use getenv or putenv and os.environ, you might find that you put an environment, an, environment for the very, an environmental variable in and you couldn't get it back out, couldn't find it. Now, one thing that this kind of, one, one thing this kind of makes you curious about is if in C there aren't really data structures and when we looked at our proc self environ, it was just a giant contiguous piece of memory of null terminated strings and in Python, it's a dictionary. Well, dictionaries are constant time lookup, and linear structures are linear time lookup. So wouldn't it be faster to write a program in Python to look up environmental variables than writing one in C? So here I have a very simple program that just looks up an environmental variable 10,000 times, one in C and one in Python, and we can compare them. Because we're told in our computer science classes that what's more important than what language you're using, the most important thing is your big O complexity, your linear, your linear versus your constant time complexity, right? 
And so if we write a little test program to test this out, we can see that if you compare Python versus C, oh wait, actually it's much faster in C. So it turns out a lot of things are a lot faster in C, even ignoring the big O time complexity, those coefficients are actually quite meaningful. And in fact, if you look at the test results, you can see, well, not really. Because if you ignore the blip at 10,000, it's much faster to have a Python program if you have 100,000 environmental variables. So if you learn anything from this talk, it is, <laughs> if you have a program with 100,000 environmental variables, then maybe Python is a good choice, because the Python dictionary has been optimized quite well for this purpose. And that linear search, you know, the constant factors eventually do catch up to you. Now, in a couple of examples, if you try to run this with more, you'll see a lot of noise here. Look at this. Python at 125,000 environmental variables is twice as fast. So now we have a very clear use case for Python in production. Those C programmers can't tell us anything. Now, setting that aside, one thing that you might be kind of interested about is why do we have get env and put env? It seems like we're going back to the old Java days with getters and setters. Like, we know that if you have some state in Python, like some state associated with their sys.path, you do things like path.append, and it actually goes and mutates that path object in place. But then you have this discontinuity where if you have like the recursion limit in the sys module, you have a get recursion limit and a set recursion limit, and you might say to yourself, well, you know, getters and setters are kind of passe in Python. That's why we have properties, right? That's why, and, and, and you might say, you know, this is bad style. But at the same time, things like get and set recursion limit predate properties. They're from a long time ago. And you might say, maybe that's even why the matplotlib API is the way it is. Because in some cases, it's so old, it predates a lot of what we consider to be modern Python. In other cases, it's, that's matplotlib. You got 11. <laughs> now, but if you look a little bit deeper, you'll see that this is actually quite consistent. Because even in the sys module, with something like get coroutine wrapper and set coroutine wrapper, there's still a getter and a setter. And we've been told so many times, getters and setters, that's not Pythonic. I wonder why that is, especially considering that in Python 3.7 with PEP 562, we actually have module level get adder. In other words, down here, if we have in a module a function called get adder at the module scope and we import that module, we can do kind of get adder behavior. See? We can implement that. So why wouldn't we just use get module level get adder instead of getters and setters? Well, the downside is we don't have a set adder, so we couldn't set anything in the module, but there's something much more fundamental to all of this puzzle. And it comes back to a question that I always ask whenever I do a corporate training. I always ask my class, what's the difference between from math import log and import math math.log? What's the difference between these two? I'll pause for a second to let you think. Which of these is right? Well, the answer is neither is right because you can't take the log of zero. That's a domain error. But what's the difference? Why does it matter? Well, it turns out that there's actually a very fundamental difference. There's a real significant difference here. And it's a very subtle and it's very minor, and it ties back to our environment story. What's the answer? Well, the answer is one of these is early binding, and one of these is late binding. In other words, when you say from math import log, it's the exact same thing as saying import math, log equals math.log, and log is zero. It'll give you the exact same error at the exact same time, but what the meaningful difference here is, are you capturing the value of that function as of the line when you did the import, or are you capturing the value of that function whenever you're calling that function out of that module? Are you getting the most recent value or the least recent? And if you go back to these examples, you'll see something very interesting. In sys.path, where is sys.path used? Well, it's only really used in the internal machinery of the Python import mechanism. Path is a list, so it's mutable. And so to make it directly mutatable is quite easy. If you early bind it, that's fine, because probably somebody who should be modifying their path shouldn't say sys.path equals path plus whatever. They should be using .insert or .append to directly mutate it in case an early binding occurred. Or, in the cases of these three, these are mostly doing things like setting functions, which are immutable objects, and there could be a risk that each one of these things could be used in some third-party library somewhere, could have accidentally been early bound, and because they accidentally got early bound, you'd run up into very strange anomalies in your program where an early bound and a late bound variable, where there was a clash. You thought you had set something and it hadn't actually gotten set. Now, how does this tie back to n? Well, it turns out that you never really know when your, sys dot, when, you, when your environment variables are actually bound. They exist in that structure in your main, in your, they exist as part of that signature of your entry point, as part of that signature of your main. They could have been copied from there. You always have the ability to access what the original environmental variables that were passed to your program are. You can do put env operations to your heart's delight, but you really, never really know, 
if a program at some point in time has done a put env operation, and if some other part of that program at some point in time is going to do a get env operation, or if it's bounded at some early point. Because you never really know that, there's one clear guideline with environmental variables. Don't change them over the course of your program. When I put these slides together, the analogy that I came up with that was widely hated by all the people who heard it was that environmental variables are kind of like React. You pass props down, and everything's immutable. And so the answer is, don't change environmental variables in flight. Environmental variables are a way of processes to communicate under a very strict set of conditions. That condition being, they're set at start, they're used during the program, they're only ever looked up, and they're never changed. Because you end up with strange anomalies very similar to, to your early late binding problem in, in Python when you have environmental variables that change in flight. You should only ever pass environmental variables down to child processes that you then launch as opposed to changing them as part of your current process. Which is quite unfortunate because as, as part of this talk, one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to show you uh, the ability to change environmental variables into a process at runtime. And it turns out it's quite easy to do. You can do a dot P, you can, you can use ptrace to go into the processes space and you can find exactly where that environmental variable structure is. It's in, it's in your, uh, you know, it's just in global memory. It's not that hard to find. And if you dig through the code for libc, you can even find that this is your libc for set env. This is your, sorry, this is your libc for get env, and all it does is operate on one global variable that you have access to. This is your library for put env, and all it really does is look at that same global variable. This is your library. This is what it actually calls in the, at the end of the day add to environ, and all it really does is operate on one global variable called environ with two underscores at the beginning, and you can mutate that to your heart's delight. But since you never really know when this is bound, you can never really guarantee that that'll have any effect in your program it will actually work. And so taking that input in mind and thinking about what did I learn over this absolutely bizarre talk, I want to talk briefly about what the takeaways are. And when I was presenting these notes to one of my colleagues who's in the audience today, one of the takeaways that he suggested was, you know what? Even for a very small, very minor problem that nobody really thinks about, something that you just live with that's part of your every single day life, there might be code behind it, and you could just go and read that code. You go read through libc. And so the answer is not you can read through libc. That is a terrible takeaway, Joe. Nobody wants to read through libc. Nobody cares. The takeaway is I gave this talk the wrong title. I should have called it L'Enfant Terrible. Thank you so much. I think we're right on time. We got five minutes until the next session, right? You want anyone have any questions? That was so pointless, wasn't it? Anyone like the absolutely pointless benchmark? I was very proud. That took me so long to do. Probably some kind of L1 caching thing. You're looking at these linear scans of some, some block of memory that could be. That, that assumes you're running on Windows, right? I don't... <laughs> Does anybody use Windows? I don't think so. That's that? That's that? <laughs> so there we go. I think we're just about to go into lightning talks. So I hope you enjoyed this, this little piece of fun. I hope you've been enjoying the conference so far. I think part of the reason that I give talks like this is to show you that there is some fun to be had in programming. That's not a message or a takeaway because takeaways and messages are kind of stupid in talks. But it's just to tell you that it's okay to not be altogether too serious.